Hello everyone, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. Wishing you a pleasant listening experience. Today, I'm going to interpret the book, The Happiness Trap, for you. I believe that if you've chosen to open this audiobook today and are willing to invest half an hour in it, you're probably someone who cares about personal happiness and is actively seeking it. It's natural, most of us want to make ourselves happier. However, this book is here to tell us that often, the harder we pursue happiness, the more likely we are to feel unhappy. This is precisely what the title of the book, The Happiness Trap, signifies. So, how does this trap come into existence? Is there a way to break free from it? Don't worry, all of these questions will be answered in this book. Allow me to give you a brief overview. In this book, the method for breaking free from the happiness trap is called acceptance and commitment therapy, abbreviated as ACT. The approach of this therapy is quite different from traditional methods, which often advocate fighting and eliminating negative emotions. ACT, on the other hand, encourages complete acceptance of reality and then taking action according to your chosen values. This might sound a bit abstract, but we'll delve into it further. ACT is a heart-shaped gem in the field of clinical psychology and has proven to be an effective tool for many counselors. The author of this book, Dr. Russ Harris, is an internationally renowned clinical psychologist and an expert in the field of acceptance and commitment therapy. This book provides a comprehensive and detailed explanation of ACT, and as a book focused on happiness, its methods can be applied to almost every area of value in our lives, such as family, intimate relationships, career, education, entertainment, health, and more. In the time ahead, I will follow the book's structure and interpret it for you in three parts. First, in the initial section, we'll explore how the happiness trap forms and why we fall into it. Then, in the second and third sections, we'll discuss the methods to break free from the happiness trap and specifically, acceptance and commitment therapy, as outlined in the book. In the second section, we'll delve into the concept of acceptance within ACT. This doesn't mean passively accepting all those negative thoughts or emotions, but rather, using certain techniques to coexist with them harmoniously and reduce their adverse impact on our lives. In the third section, we'll talk about the commitment aspect of acceptance and commitment therapy. This involves focusing your attention and action on what you truly value, which can lead to long-term inner satisfaction and happiness. Alright, let's dive into the first section and discuss how the happiness trap is formed. The author tells us that the reason this trap exists is that many times, our pursuit of happiness is misguided. So, what are the roadblocks to happiness that we encounter in life? Perhaps a student feels anxious because their academic performance isn't improving. A wife may feel disheartened because the intimacy with her husband isn't as it used to be. A professional might feel frustrated and powerless due to work-related setbacks. Or it could be as simple as dissatisfaction with one's appearance, income, or family situation, or negative emotions arising from unexpected life events. Now, how should we respond when these roadblocks to happiness appear? Let me outline a few common traditional approaches, see if any of them sound familiar. For instance, telling yourself that everything happening in your life is for the best or giving yourself pep talks like, I am strong, capable, and will achieve my goals. Or perhaps, imagining yourself living your ideal, wonderful life, filling your mind with positive imagery, and so on. You'll notice that the underlying logic of these methods is to exert control over our brains, to combat negative emotions with positive ones. However, the author argues that pursuing happiness in this way is entirely wrong. Why, you ask? First and foremost, our brains aren't that easily controlled. You may have heard of a famous psychological experiment, don't think about a blue elephant. Essentially, psychologists tell participants they can think about anything except a blue elephant. What do you think happens? Well, they end up thinking about a blue elephant. In other words, the more you try not to think about something, the more you unconsciously think about it. So, controlling the brain is a challenging endeavor. It's not as straightforward as controlling the physical world, where you can build walls and barriers. Many times, no matter how much we try to motivate or comfort ourselves or imagine positive things, we can't control our thoughts and eliminate those negative emotions. Furthermore, often, you'll find that the more you attempt various methods to rid yourself of negative emotions, the worse the problem becomes. For example, there's Xiao Li, who frequently agonizes over his overweight body. When he's upset, he turns to chocolate for relief. 
This temporarily boosts his mood but contributes to further weight gain, trapping him in a cycle of frustration. Then there's Xiao Zhang, who's afraid of social situations and becomes anxious during conversations. He dislikes this feeling, so he avoids crowded places, refrains from social gatherings, and spends most of his time alone, which only exacerbates his fear and loneliness. Lastly, there's Xiao Wang, whose relationship with his wife has become strained. His wife is increasingly dissatisfied because Xiao Wang is always busy with work and has little time for the family. Feeling the tension at home, Xiao Wang starts spending even more time at the office, worsening the relationship. Up to this point, we've discussed various strategies people employ to eliminate negative emotions or thoughts. You'll notice that these strategies can generally be categorized into two types often mentioned in neuroscience, fight and flight. Flight strategies involve avoidance, distraction, self-numbing, while fight strategies include attempts to suppress or counteract negative thoughts with positive ones, among others. All these strategies, whether they belong to the fight or flight category, share a common name in this book, control strategies. This is because they all fundamentally attempt to control our feelings and our brains. As we mentioned earlier, this often proves ineffective and can even backfire. The central point emphasized in this book is that the happiness trap is created by precisely this, ineffective control strategies. So, are all control strategies ineffective? Not necessarily. For instance, let's say you recently had an argument with a colleague, felt upset and angry, and decided to take an hour-long walk afterward, you felt much calmer. Or perhaps, after a strenuous day at work, feeling mentally drained, you lay on the couch, closed your eyes, listened to music for a while, and found that it alleviated your fatigue and boredom. These are examples of moderately effective control strategies. Now, how can we distinguish between effective and ineffective control strategies? From the book, we can conclude that if you're unsure whether a particular control strategy is effective, you can ask yourself four questions. 1. Did it consume a significant amount of my time and energy? 2. Did it genuinely help me eliminate negative feelings, thoughts, and emotions? 3. Did it bring about any other negative consequences? 4. Did it take me further away from living the ideal life I desire? If you find that one or two of your answers to these questions are affirmative, then it's quite likely an ineffective control strategy. For instance, consider Xiao Lu, who feels miserable due to a failed promotion and repeatedly tells himself that everything is for the best. However, his mood often swings back to sadness shortly after. Or as we mentioned earlier, there's Xiao Li, who tries to relieve stress by eating chocolate. Instead of improving his emotions, this habit leads to weight gain. Then there's Xiao Zhang, who attempts to alleviate his social anxiety by avoiding social gatherings. Paradoxically, this isolation makes him even more fearful of social situations and increasingly lonely, taking him farther from his ideal life. So, these are all ineffective control strategies. Now, if you find yourself employing ineffective control strategies when faced with negative emotions or thoughts, what should you do? The author's recommendation is as follows. First and foremost, stop as soon as possible to prevent falling into the happiness trap. Secondly, if you're willing, you can try a different approach introduced in this book, which is quite distinct from control strategies, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT. In the following audio segments, I will break down this method into two parts, acceptance and commitment, and guide you through the principles and practical application of this therapy. Now, let's delve into the first part of acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT acceptance. First, let's play a simple game. Take 10 seconds to think about what you want to have for breakfast tomorrow. You can hit pause, close your eyes, and think about it. Alright, now open your eyes. During this brief exercise, you probably had thoughts about what you'd like to eat tomorrow morning, such as soy milk and fried dough sticks, milk and bread, or coffee and scrambled eggs, among others. But at the same time, did you notice some words or phrases flashing through your mind, as if there was a voice speaking? For example, I want a ham sandwich, or I have no idea what to eat. These words and phrases that popped into your head are what we've been referring to as thoughts. Every day, countless thoughts pass through our brains. Some of these thoughts are factual, like having a meeting in the afternoon or needing to wake up early tomorrow, or perhaps that the lunch wasn't very tasty. Then there are thoughts that aren't factual but are stories our brains tell us, such as defining what kind of person you are, how others perceive you, what's wrong with you, and what the future holds. 
However, many times, the stories our brains tell us tend to be negative. For instance, I'm not good enough, I'm stupid, I'm overweight, my life is awful, there's no hope for the future, nobody likes me, or, this relationship is doomed. This is entirely normal. Studies have shown that about 80% of the thoughts in the human brain can be considered negative. Most of these are stories our brains tell us. The problem is that many people treat these negative stories as facts. This condition is referred to as cognitive fusion, like repeatedly messing up a few things and then hearing your brain say, I'm utterly useless, or hearing a voice saying, I'm a terrible mother, and then genuinely believing you're such a person. Or, when faced with a challenging task, your brain immediately says, I can't do it, and it feels like failure is already a fact. Often, the reason we feel anxious, depressed, self-doubting, or uneasy is due to cognitive fusion, where we accept these negative stories our brains tell us as facts. In acceptance and commitment therapy, we aim to do the opposite, which is called cognitive diffusion. Cognitive diffusion means that when our brains present these negative stories, we consciously recognize them as just stories. We don't take them too seriously, don't give them too much attention, and don't waste precious time and energy trying to resist them. To help us achieve this, the book provides several practical cognitive diffusion techniques. For instance, you can recall a negative thought that frequently occurs in your mind, such as, I'm weak, my life is terrible, or, my job is annoying. Now, hold on to that thought for a moment and try to believe it as much as you can. Pay attention to how it makes you feel. Alright, now keep that thought but add a short phrase before it, I'm having the thought that. For example, I'm having the thought that I'm weak. Let that sentence linger in your mind for a while and notice how your feeling may have changed. You'll likely find that by adding the, I'm having the thought that, phrase, you create some distance between yourself and the previous thought. It's like taking a step back and calmly observing it. Its impact on you also tends to lessen, and this is a form of cognitive diffusion. There are other methods besides this one to achieve cognitive diffusion, as mentioned in the book. For example, you can classify and label the stories your brain tells you. When your brain starts telling you a negative story, calmly recognize it and say in your mind, Oh, I recognize you. You're the same old, I'm a failure, story. Once you recognize a story, it becomes much easier. You don't need to challenge or push it away, and you don't have to invest too much attention in it. Just go about doing what you need to do and let it be. Additionally, the book introduces some interesting techniques, such as thanking your brain. When a negative thought arises, silently say, I acknowledge it. Thank you, my brain. Or respond with curiosity, saying, really? That's an interesting story. Furthermore, there are techniques like, singing thoughts, where you sing the melodies of your negative thoughts, either aloud or silently in your mind. Another method is, voice replacement, which involves substituting the voice in your head with the voice of a familiar character from movies or TV shows. These techniques can also facilitate cognitive diffusion. In summary, cognitive fusion tells us that thoughts are the same as reality and extremely important. On the other hand, cognitive diffusion reminds us that thoughts are not the same as reality and aren't as crucial. However, you might still have some questions. For instance, how do we determine whether a thought requires diffusion? Should we diffuse thoughts that are actually true? The book provides a straightforward answer. We don't need to overly concern ourselves with whether a thought is true. Instead, we should focus on whether the thought is helpful to us. For example, a thought like, you've gained weight, and no one will like you anymore, isn't particularly helpful. Conversely, a thought like, you've gained weight, and it's time to lose some, serves as motivation. Similarly, a thought like, you made a mistake, and you're utterly incompetent, only leads to frustration, whereas, you made a mistake, analyze the reasons, and improve, can enhance our work abilities. The author suggests that when a thought arises, we can quickly assess whether it will be beneficial to us. Will it drive us toward creating the life we desire? If the answer is yes, then the thought is worth considering. If the answer is no, it's time to diffuse it. As we become proficient in using cognitive diffusion techniques, we can gradually transform into self-observers. When unhelpful negative thoughts or emotions surge in, we can observe them as if we were a spectator sitting by the riverbank, watching them flow through our minds like water. In the book, The Confidence Trap, we discussed a mindfulness technique called, Mindful Breathing. This book also mentions it, 
which involves focusing your attention on each breath you take. If your mind wanders due to a certain thought during this practice, it's alright, don't dwell on it. Simply redirect your attention back to your breath. This technique can help us achieve the state of self-observation mentioned earlier. Alright, what we've just covered is the acceptance part of acceptance and commitment therapy as detailed in the book. After completing this step, your thoughts and actions are in a relatively separated state. This means you can stop worrying about those negative thoughts that float around in your mind and focus on doing what you need to do. So, how do you determine what you need to do? This is what we're going to discuss in the second part of acceptance and commitment therapy, called commitment. It means defining your values and then taking actions in alignment with those values. But what are values? They are the things you truly desire deep within yourself. Some people might quickly respond with, I want to be wealthy, I want to be famous, or I want to achieve success in a certain field. However, the author suggests that these answers, while possibly genuine, may not be deep enough. Your true desires might be hidden beneath these initial responses. For example, if someone says they want a lot of money, you could further ask, what would having a lot of money allow you to do? They might respond, I wouldn't have to work and could do what I enjoy. In this case, it's not really about the money, it's about the freedom to pursue their interests. Similarly, if someone says they want to be famous, you can ask, what would being famous enable you to experience? They might reply, people would respect me wherever I go. Here, it's not fame itself that's important, it's the desire for respect from others. You might find it challenging to pinpoint your deepest desires all at once. In such cases, you can break down this question into different areas of life. For example, in the realm of love, what kind of intimate relationship do you desire? In your family life, what kind of parent, mother, son, or daughter do you want to be? In your work, what is the most important thing you want to achieve? In the audiobook, I provided a life values questionnaire extracted from Yuan's book. If you're interested, you can use these questions to explore your values in different areas of life. The author emphasizes that values are not the same as goals. Goals are specific outcomes you want to achieve and can be completed. For example, getting married is a goal, and once achieved, it's done. On the other hand, values are directions you continually move toward, like becoming a compassionate and understanding partner, which you strive to embody throughout your life. If you ever find yourself acting in a way that contradicts your values, you'll become aware that you've deviated from your value direction. For instance, if you act unkindly or indifferently when your value direction is to be compassionate, you'll recognize the misalignment. Additionally, if you desire an ideal job, that's a goal. But if your desire is to continuously learn and grow through your work, that's a value direction. In essence, a value direction is like continually moving eastward, no matter how far you've come, you can always keep heading east. In contrast, a goal is like a mountain to climb or a river to cross on your journey eastward. Once you've scaled the mountain or crossed the river, it's completed. Alright, after determining your values, the next step is to take supportive actions towards these values. So, how do you do that? The book provides five steps, and here, we'll discuss these steps within the context of intimate relationships. First, step one is to identify your value direction. This could be, for example, being a compassionate and caring partner in intimate relationships, as we discussed earlier. Step two involves setting immediate goals, which are small and easily achievable tasks you can complete today. For instance, after work today, Take a slightly longer route home to meet your partner at their workplace and go back together. Step 3 is about setting short-term goals. You can ask yourself what small actions you can take for your values in the coming days or weeks. Make sure these actions are as specific as possible, including details like time, place, and action. For example, next Friday night, plan to take your partner to see a newly released romantic movie. Or in the next two weekends, organize and clean your and your partner's seasonal clothes, and store away the out-of-season ones. Step 4 is setting midterm goals. Ask yourself what larger challenges you are willing to embrace in the next few months in alignment with your values. Again, be as specific as possible. For example, cooking dinner for your partner every Tuesday and Friday evening, or planning a short trip together once a month. The author advises against setting goals that involve avoiding certain actions, like not getting angry with your partner. 
Instead, reframe these goals as constructive actions. For instance, when faced with a difficult situation, take two deep breaths and then discuss possible solutions with your partner. Step 5 is about setting long-term goals, which could span from 5 to 10 years or even longer. Here, you can let your imagination run wild. For example, envision a future where you and your partner have two children, maintain a sweet relationship, or embark on a European adventure. Now, we've been discussing these five steps within the context of intimate relationships, but you can apply them to other areas of your life, such as your career. If your value direction in your professional life is continuous growth, your immediate goal could be seeking advice from a senior colleague on a business matter today. Short-term goals might involve summarizing your accomplishments and areas for improvement after completing a project. Mid-term goals could include taking on a larger project and excelling in it over the next quarter. However, the author advises against setting goals related to avoiding specific actions, like not getting angry at colleagues. Instead, focus on actions that guide your behavior positively. Now, you might wonder why we've introduced goals when we initially emphasized the difference between goals and value directions. The author's explanation is that pursuing goals solely for the sake of achieving them is different from pursuing goals while staying aligned with your values. Here's a story to illustrate the point. Imagine a mother planning a two-hour trip to the zoo with her two children. One child is goal-oriented, impatient to reach the destination. Throughout the journey, this child remains restless, constantly asking, are we there yet? The other child, value-oriented, is focused on enjoying the journey. She gazes out of the window, appreciates the changing scenery, and feels no impatience. In these two children, we can see two different life attitudes, goal-oriented and value-oriented. The goal-oriented child fixates on the destination and experiences anxiety, while the value-oriented child sees the goal as a milestone on the path towards her values. Compared to a goal-oriented approach, a value-oriented approach to life tends to lead to more happiness because it allows you to enjoy the process while striving for your goals. In your action plan, the short-term and long-term goals are merely milestones on the path to your values. As long as you hold your values in your heart and persist in the direction of your values, these goals will provide motivation without causing unnecessary distress. In conclusion, happiness is not a trap, but the pursuit of happiness often comes with its own set of pitfalls. This book reminds us that the more we chase happiness, the more we may try to control our feelings. However, this effort doesn't always make us feel better, in fact, it can sometimes make us feel worse. So, how can we break free from this happiness trap? This book presents a method called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, ACT, which offers a different approach from traditional methods. Unlike previous approaches that advocate for fighting or eliminating negative emotions or thoughts, ACT's first step, known as acceptance, encourages us not to resist or try to eliminate these negative emotions or thoughts. Instead, we should acknowledge their presence. For those negative thoughts that don't serve us, we should learn to practice cognitive diffusion, which involves techniques like adding a prepositional phrase in front of your thoughts, categorizing and naming the stories our minds tell us, thanking our brains for their input, singing or saying our thoughts aloud, and even substituting our inner voice with that of a familiar movie character. After completing this step, your thoughts and behaviors will be in a relatively separate state. This means you can focus on what you need to do without being preoccupied by those drifting negative thoughts. Now, how do you determine what you need to do? This leads us to the second step of ACT, which is called, commitment. This step involves identifying your value direction, which is essentially what you deeply desire in your heart, and then taking actions in alignment with this value direction. This approach helps us minimize the impact of negative thoughts or emotions on our actual lives. Even if they exist, they won't hinder us from creating the life we genuinely want. As a book that teaches us how to become happier, this book offers an important reminder, true happiness doesn't come from simple feelings of joy, it arises from the process of creating a meaningful life. Just as the philosopher Nietzsche once said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. When you focus on your true value direction instead of fleeting gains and losses or fluctuating emotions, you'll discover that you're becoming a stronger person, leading a more fulfilling and meaningful life. This, indeed, is the way to break free from the happiness trap. Congratulations, you've completed another book. Thank you for listening to the Tim Booker channel. Please subscribe to Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. 
Let's combine wisdom and practicality to achieve our financial goals and create a better future together. Thank you, and goodbye.